Welcome back to Podcast 3 of 2020. I'm your host, Kiev O'Neill. You can tweet me at OBKiev, tweet us at The Odds Breakers, or follow us on social media slash The Odds Breakers. This episode is being brought to you by jazzsports.ag for a 50% sign-up bonus. And if you need a good sports book, please visit Jazz Sports and use a promo code Odds breakers, terms and conditions apply. If you'd like to help us out with our costs, sponsor the podcast, we would love to help you out. Please visit the oddsbreakers.com, click shop, and become a member. For $17.99 a month, you can become a premium subscriber and get my plays and premium plays before the line moves. For $2 more, you can have all that and become a patron subscriber. Get the podcast a little bit early. Let's check out the website and click shop for that as well. And if nothing else, Please visit theoddsbreakers.com and become a free picks newsletter subscriber. So, wanted to do a quick podcast here. Like I said, they're, they're not always just going to be once a week. We're still going to do our Thursday pod with a guest, come up with some plays for you for college basketball this weekend. And we actually had a pretty good weekend. Saturday wasn't quite as good. I believe we were... Um, Four and five on Saturday, but if, but Friday we were one and zero, and Sunday we were two and zero in college basketball. This is all college basketball, and so we ended up seven and five uh, the whole weekend. So that worked out a little bit of profit there in basketball. You know, it's funny all the free plays minus the Clem, uh, uh, NC State one uh, worked out really well. Uh, the Duke uh, over hit by a lot. That was easy. Penn State hit. It was fantastic. My Florida play hit. Um, Maryland on the uh, newsletter hit. But uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't even play that one. I'm not counting the ones I don't play, of course. The Maryland came out awfully juiced. And uh, it was it was just a little bit too juiced for me. And kind of like how Michigan State came out and we bet the under instead, if you if you see seen on the news article. But if you did bet the side, that hit anyway. And uh, just an overall great weekend. And uh, the reason I'm, we're doing this podcast is because I want to do a little bit of a Super Bowl look ahead here. Just give you a few quick thoughts about that. And I uh, want to talk a little bit about college basketball as well. Let's get into a little NFL recap. The Kansas City Chiefs and the San Francisco 49ers are going to the Super Bowl. And our teaser hit and actually hit with ease. Uh, after the second quarter, wasn't really much of a sweat with that teaser. Uh, the first game was pretty good with Kansas City. They were down 10 points, and I was able to hedge that 40-1 to Tennessee play that I had. So ended up just fine on that one. I hedged a little before the game, and when they were down 10 nothing, I'm like, boom, there it is. And uh, was able to uh, uh, be okay there. As far as the four-star teaser, I was really happy about that. We don't do four-star teasers often, and uh, that was just the perfect spot for it. And it came through. Our premium play on San Francisco's side went, uh, hit him easily. Now, the one that didn't hit was at Kansas City. Uh, Patrick Mahomes has the most passing yards, minus 140. And, uh, yeah, but Aaron, Aaron Rodgers actually messed that one up for us, and the reason that is is because they are passing the whole second half. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if they didn't start so behind, 27 to zip in the second half, I I thought that thing had a chance. And then Devontae Adams, wide freaking open and uh, kind of ruined those little things. But overall, if you take, uh, you know, the amount of units on the uh, teaser in in the side for San Fran, it was a great weekend for the NFL for us. Very profitable. So very happy about all that. Now. This Super Bowl matchup, I got to tell you, this is a great, just a fantastic matchup. But Kyle Shanahan, you know I was on him all year. Love him as a coach. He was the reason that I bet Atlanta that one year. 
and had to hedge back with the Patriots, unfortunately. But uh, would have been a bigger payout if Atlanta won that year. But it was all Kyle Shanahan, as you can see. Look at how far Atlanta has fell down since he left, all right, progressively throughout the years. And so he goes to San Francisco, and all his misdirection plays, all his running plays, Debo Samuels running, you know, Emmanuel Sanders once in a while. They had four running backs. Well, probably three now because uh, I think Coleman's pretty injured there. But we'll talk a little bit more about that, obviously. And we're going to talk more about the Super Bowl the next couple podcasts anyway. But my early thoughts are Jimmy Garoppolo hasn't really showed me a lot in the playoffs. I mean, he hasn't had had to uh, really do a lot here. I mean, what do you have, eight pass attempts? players were wide open at the end of that game so he was six for eight you know this last weekend so it's really tough for me to figure out if uh he's going to be able to do it when uh, kansas city is lighting up the uh, scoreboard now one thing i was probably going to lean san fran before this uh sunday if there was going to be this matchup which i expected but now that's changed a little bit. San Fran's really banged up, it seems. Uh, Coleman's out, probably. His shoulder, it looked bad. He got carted off. And, uh, I mean, Mostert's killing it, right? He's doing fine, and so is Breda. But still, you know, he was uh, a key guy there. And they're going to have to put up some points to beat Kansas City. You know, the Packers were a very bad road team, and it showed it. They couldn't even touch the running game. Mostert had well over 200 yards rushing in that game. It was embarrassing for Green Bay. But uh, Kansas City has improved their defense. As you saw, they are able to kind of contain Henry enough to uh, take the lead and then put the ball in Tannehill's hands. That's exactly why that that uh, uh, they did really well and, and, and why they covered that spread. Now, it, what's interesting about that is I didn't want to take the minus seven because just as you saw that last drive, it was Tennessee scores, you lose the bet. And you still, Kansas City still wins the game. Kansas City might have given up a score, you know, just let that back. But instead, uh, Tennessee couldn't score and they ended up winning the game by 11. So, either way, Kansas City is very powerful, is what I'm trying to say. They're very, very powerful, and, and the fact that their defense has stepped up a little bit is interesting. But to be honest with you, for as good as Derrick Henry is, the run game for San Francisco is much worse. <laughs> I mean, it's much worse on their defense because – they come from all directions. You know, Derrick Henry was Derrick Henry. He just kind of, you're the linebacker, just follow where Henry goes. Well, it's not like that because many people can run the ball on San Francisco, and uh, they're also going to be able to open it up for some easy throws for Garoppolo. So that's what makes this matchup interesting. The other thing is that uh, Kansas City, you know, they just score. I mean, they just score for score. If I'm Kansas City, the way I play this game is I I, I have to stop the run and, and up front. I have to stop anything between the tackles. I have to watch everything come out of the sides. Go one on one in the receivers and make Jimmy Garoppolo beat you. You know, <laughs> they have so many weapons though. He's Kittle right there is just such a matchup nightmare for everybody. You know, so got to stop. Got to stop him. And uh, then all of a sudden you'll see them pass to uh, Juszczyk, you know, the fullback, Kyle Juszczyk. That could easily happen. Debo Samuel is going to be open. Emmanuel Sanders is going to be open. Pettis will be hanging out. Kendrick Bourne might get even a pass or two. So, yeah, nothing easy. Um, <laughs> it's not going to be easy feat, but the thing is, is uh, Kansas City is going to go score for score with them most likely. You saw San Fran's defense taper out a little bit, you know, and San Fran's just so great against the run, but when they play against a, a team that can pass, they get points scored against them, you know. Um, you saw the Saints, you know, score over 40 points on them. You saw Russell Wilson go in there and beat them because he's just a passing quarterback. He's a passing game, and that's what Kansas City does. They are a passing game, and if it's going to be quarterback versus quarterback, I'll tell you this, you got to give the edge to the MVP of last year, Mr. Patrick Mahomes, a.k.a. Sideshow Bob. 
So the thing that makes me lean Kansas City, and I'm going to tell you I'm going to lean Kansas City, is if no matter what, if Kansas City's down, they can come back. You just know it. You even saw the Packers were able to get some yards. Now, yeah, the defense let off a little bit for San Fran, but still the, some of those throws to Devontae Adams beat Richard Sherman. You know, Some of those show, throws to uh, Allison was there. A lot of those throws to Jimmy Graham and their uh, third receiver, Savage, or something like that, escaping, escaping my mind. But uh, either way, Kansas City is going to be able to do that against San Fran's defense. So if the Niners are down by 10 points in the third quarter or 14 points, I don't know how they're going to come back. They're not going to be wanting to run the ball. And maybe maybe it, it's going to be all up to Kyle Shanahan. It, maybe he just has enough awesome plays, misdirection plays, key pass plays, maybe hypes up Jimmy Garoppolo just enough to do that. But I want to pay to see that. And so I'll probably have a little bit of money on Kansas City at the minus one. But I'll tell you this. If that goes up past minus three, that's possibly a buyback right there for San Fran. Now, if you look at it from straight power ratings, um, I, I have them just about equal. And I'm going to go. I didn't make my complete adjustments yet, so I'm going to go over that. So right now, I would have a small play on Kansas City. I think the spread can go up to three. So I would, if, if you like Kansas City or if you just want some line value, I would recommend getting that one a little bit early. All right, we had some listener questions I'd like to talk about on the podcast. I know um, a lot of those I just answer via Twitter or just via the message when you guys send me a message, but we'll do a couple of these on the podcast now as well. And if you have any questions out there, I'd love to hear it. Come just tweet us at theoddsbreakers.com, tweet me at OBKF, whatever you want. Uh, we I could uh, definitely try to answer those to the best of my knowledge. So the first question was for at 4 Cooper. It's about teasing college hoops, okay? So he asked if I do it, and in general, the answer is no. I really don't tease them too often. Now, maybe during March Madness, I might every once in a while. But the rule of thumb to teasing these things, um, especially in football, is for a low total. You want a low total where there's low variance, when there's a high total, that means some teams are either at least one of those teams can score a lot and they can make it past uh, the, the average six point teaser that people take. OK, so um, as you see, as you can see with Duke, right, Duke uh, just played Louisville. Duke was an eight point favorite. Duke lost the game outright. Anyone who teased Duke at home at Cameron Indoor, which you would think they would win, lost that bet. Uh, college basketball in general is very high variance. You know, it's, you just don't know when one team's going to be hot, and you just do not know when one team is unfortunately not going to be hot. So, uh, uh, just wanted to let you know that I don't do that. Now, on a Virginia versus, uh, let's just say Texas Tech type game, where your where your total is going to be about one hundred and thirteen, <laughs> or maybe like Manhattan versus. Uh, Fairfield, yeah, that, you know, you're going to get a, a total of something extremely low, you know, maybe like 105 points or something. That that then maybe tease it, but uh, I personally don't. I think college basketball just has way too much variance. The only sport I really tease is the NFL. Uh, don't even tease for college football. But to to each their own. I mean, there's people that have success doing it. Some people might do a three team ten point teaser. I'd probably be more prone to do a three-team 10-point teaser than a um, two-team six-point teaser or seven-point teaser in college basketball. The next question comes from Tanner. He asked us if we could talk a little bit about bankroll management, some of the some of the best practices with adjusting the unit amount after success or loss. So, I have a huge article on uh, Sports Betting 101. I talk a lot about bank bro management, how you should be betting 1% for one star or one unit of your total bankroll. So, for example, if you start with $10,000, your bet, your smallest bet 
should well not I, you can go half a unit i guess but your one star bet is one hundred dollars okay so if so if you give out a two star bet or talk about a two star bet that bet is two hundred dollars if it's a five star bet which is, should be the max that's five hundred dollars and so um that's very important because there's a lot of ebbs and flows to sports betting. So, um, you know, he, he, he may have already known that, but he, his question was, should I adjust the unit amount after each day? And my answer is no, <laughs> definitely not. Keep the same unit amount throughout the whole season of the sport you are betting. You can reassess later in the next season or the next sport you decide to start with. You can start with a higher bankroll if you want, but uh, there's no reason to adjust the unit size in the middle of the season. Keep that in the way because I'll tell you this. I think this happened to me years ago. Start went on a hell of a hot streak, and I think it was in college football, and then I had like two or three bad weeks in a row, and I happened to up my unit size, and I lost it all and even went down into my bankroll a bit, and that was very painful. That's the stuff that can happen when you start playing with the karma of betting, uh, the sports betting world, really, it's betting sports in general. So in my opinion, you should not adjust. Do what you're doing this the whole year. Now, the exception, I guess, would be is let's just say you started with 10000 and you're up to 15000 and uh, you want to you, you really have a good feel for the rest of the year. You want to adjust your unit size. Well, then 1% of 15000 is $150. So, I mean, at the worst, just do that. I personally wouldn't, but you can absolutely do that as, as long as one unit is 1% of your bankroll. Now, if you're losing and you're really losing and you're kind of down to 50% of where you started, then I would be okay with decreasing your unit size because something is going wrong, Okay. Now, hopefully that would never happen to you, but uh, I'm sure that's happened to many people. As you know, sports books do not build themselves. So if you have any other follow-up, Standard, please uh, please feel free to uh, follow up or let us know. Um, hopefully I was able to answer your question. Come on, don't bullshit me. All right. Well, now I want to quick get into the Big Ten power ratings here. Since there's been some changes, Michigan State is still number one. And uh, they had, did have that hiccup against Purdue where they didn't score anything, but then they destroyed Wisconsin at home. The question is, uh, these Big Ten teams are like 37-8 and eight right now <laughs> at home, and it's made a huge difference. And uh, that's why my second pick is Rutgers. They're just like everyone else, beating everyone at home, but they have the best amount of wins, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, but Rutgers I have as the second best uh, Big Ten heat team. They're actually ranked number 24 on Ken Palm, right around Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, but uh, I, I just I just like their victories. I mean, they only lost to three at Illinois. They beat Penn State. They beat Indiana. They beat Minnesota. They beat Wisconsin. They beat Seton Hall, and uh, you know they lost it away to Michigan State. But so so is everybody, you know. <laughs> and uh, I hate to say it. This now obviously, when I say this, the Big Ten is just so stacked from top to bottom. If you just take out Nebraska and uh, Northwestern, and it's anybody's game. I mean, Michigan State on the top. The rest of them are all really piled together. Honestly, it's not even not even all that close. So uh, I find that very interesting. Um, I have Maryland next. <laughs> I don't know why I do, but I do. They can't win on the road. We'll see what happens against Northwestern tomorrow. But then I have Illinois. <laughs> I have Illinois fourth. And they deserve it too because uh, Underwood's doing a fantastic job there with uh, Trent Frazier and Io Dos uh, Dosunmo at uh, the guards. God, they're doing great. Next, I have Iowa. Iowa's winning, you know? I mean, obviously they lost uh, Bohannon, but they're still doing well. They just, just beat up Michigan really bad at home. Then I have Penn State, who just beat Ohio State. Then I have Ohio State. They were <laughs> they really dropped for the last few weeks here. Then I have Michigan. They kind of dropped themselves. Then I have Wisconsin. 
And, uh, you know, I'm lower on Wisconsin than Ken Palm and a lot of other sites. I wonder where Bart Torg- Torvik has Wisconsin. Let's just take a look here. Yeah, um, I'm lower than Bart Torvik as well. Next one, we have Minnesota. I mean, they're starting to win some pretty big games at home, you know. Or Turu's a beast down there, Eric Curry, you know. Marcus Carr over there. We have Indiana. Indiana's uh, not doing so well. <laughs> you know, they have uh, they just finally beat uh, Northwestern. So, Or no, that was Nebraska. Well, good for Indiana there. But now they get to play Michigan State. We'll see what happens. Michigan State is traveling there. So that's going to be a real interesting game coming up here on Thursday. The next team we have is Purdue. Purdue, whew, hot and cold. It's just it's hot and cold this year. We have Nebraska, and then we have Northwestern. And uh, to be honest with you, I, Nebraska could be better because their kids are so young and they're playing a little bit better. And, hell, Northwestern played pretty well at Illinois. only lost by, like, four points. So got to give some props to Northwestern for – for fighting really hard there. It's kind of a rivalry game. You kind of expect that. I should have been on Northwestern. But we do have a play for you for our Tuesday two-pack article, and I'm just going to give this one out over the podcast. We're going to look to the Big Ten here. We have Illinois versus Purdue, and Purdue's going to be laying about six or seven points. The over-under is 132. Now, you know that the Big Ten is just so good at home, 37 and 8. There's a record straight up, but this is one spot I'm going to go against it. I know, I know, not smart, but uh, (laughs) Illinois is fantastic, and they're going to be dancing this year. As a matter of fact, we gave out Illinois at 250 to 1 to win the NCAA tournament. Well, now now they're 50 to 1. Okay, so some good value on that. And, uh, they have huge wins against Michigan, Purdue, Wisconsin, and Rutgers, you know. And they took Maryland to the wire in Baltimore. In Baltimore, I saw that game. They seem to be a pretty good road team here. Purdue, they're a shell of themselves, you know, without Carson Edwards. You know, I mean, they have a few players there, but, uh, <laughs> you know, they just either get their asses kicked or they kick ass it's just if they're hitting now obviously they're a lot more dangerous at home but uh illinois is dangerous on the road because they match up well too they have a seven footer and coffee cockburn okay uh cockburn is going to match up pretty well to uh matt harms harms seven three now travion williams is a tough matchup and he's been playing a lot better lately but uh benzanish vili Georgie from the country of Austria and Georgia is going to come down and stop him. Well, we'll see. <laughs> you know, Illinois, I think they have better guard play than Purdue. You know, I love Frazier. I love Desunmu, just like I said earlier. And uh, I just I just think that this is the kind of game that Illinois has circled, and they already beat someone on the road, and that was Wisconsin. They seem to play pretty well on the road. Now, throw away the Michigan State game, but, uh, you know, they took Maryland to the wire, too, only losing 59-58 to in Maryland. So, Purdue is good. They're very good, but they can be vulnerable at home. I know they blew out Michigan State, but they when Minnesota played them at home, That game went to double overtime, and I think these six or seven points is way too much. Like I said, I got I got uh, uh, Illinois is a much better team than Purdue. I think Illinois can win this outright, so I'm going to be taking the spread here, and I'm also going to be sprinkling the money line because I honestly think that uh, Illinois is going to win this game. Very possible, and. uh, We'll just see it. We'll, Wednesday, we'll see if this comes out. This is my free play, Illinois plus six and the sprinkle. Last week, fucked around and got a triple double. All right. Well, that's just our short podcast to talk a little bit about the Super Bowl and a game for you on Tuesday. If you have any questions, please tweet us at the Ozbreakers. We'll be back 
wonderful Thursday night, Friday morning for your weekend plays. Have a great rest of your week. Go get some winners.